Hello, William and Mary. Thank you for joining us for this week's community conversation again. This is the fifth time that we've gathered in this way. And it's sobering and a little surreal to think about the length of time that we've been apart. In that time, William and Mary has moved through crisis mode and out of it. We're now into a period of discovering what it means to operate during a pandemic. It's still incredibly difficult and uncertain. The contexts continue to change every day, as I know everybody listening knows. I always wanna begin by acknowledging the healthcare workers who may be listening now or are working around us on the front lines. Please know how grateful we are to you. I also wanna say that we are beginning to see the positive effects of self-quarantine and stay-at-home orders. We are flattening the curve of impact of COVID-19. That's a real source for optimism for me. The path ahead still, what lies ahead, remains uncertain. We're going to continue to be navigating immediate and long-term decisions with far too little information for most of us to feel comfort. So today I want to draw back the curtain a little bit on how William & Mary leadership has approached decision making over the last month and how we were thinking about the big decisions that lie ahead. Our guests today are key leaders at the university, administrators and student leaders who've been involved in that decision making process in different ways. I'm, I'm thinking about who's tuning in today in the ether. And I know that many of you are in organizations that like William & Mary had pandemic plans. But when, just about five weeks ago, we pulled out those plans and dusted them off, we all realized, I think, very quickly that they were nothing like the reality of COVID-19. Nothing had prepared us for, in advance, for imagining this scale and speed of disruption. So the first step in leadership in those unprecedented circumstances for me was to lay out principles and goals that we could hold on to and that would see us through. The goals needed to be simple and clear and defined by our mission and values. I shared those explicitly with the community. I hold to them, we continue to hold to them as our guide. Many will, I hope, know what those four goals are by now, but it is important that we keep repeating them. So I'm gonna do that again here. The first is to safeguard the health of our community and the communities surrounding us in the nation and the world. Flourishing is a key value at William and Mary and healthiness is an essential part of flourishing. The second goal is to keep teaching and keep learning because our core mission is to educate human beings. The third goal is to maintain our research and our university operations to keep working. That too is part of flourishing. The fourth goal has been and remains to join the national effort to slow the spread of COVID-19, to flatten the curve of impact on our healthcare systems and on the health of the human beings that we care for. Service is an essential part of William & Mary's history and culture. And so that goal was clear right at the beginning and remains an essential part of what we do. Now there's multiple ways to think about flattening the curve. The moral imperative to protect our healthcare systems and save lives is one. The second is the imperative to flatten the curve of economic impact. We know, we anticipate that the next 18 months will have a very, very significant impact on our economy, on, on the work and the lives of every one of us. At William & Mary, we are actively, actively working to flatten the curve of financial impact to our community. Our goal is to continue our mission of teaching and learning and research while remaining financially sustainable. We've instituted cost saving measures, including a hiring freeze. We are deferring all discretionary spending. We're thinking through what is mission critical? What do we move forward with now? What do we pause and what do we table? It's important to acknowledge that that's uncomfortable work. It's critical and prudent planning work, but it will entail disagreement, loss, disappointment as we set aside initiatives or projects that we've been looking forward to very much. So it's important that we continue to hold to those four overarching goals. 
because every decision we make needs to trace back to them. So as I said, we began with clear goals. We also began with five principles about decision making, knowing that many of the decisions that were facing us are ones we had never faced before. Those five decisions in short are that we made our decisions and we will continue to in a phased way, that we will be consultative in that process, that feedback and listening are essential to making decisions well and as we move through phased decisions to refining them. We hold the whole of William & Mary as an institution in our mind. We're making decisions in the name of the whole university and the ecosystems that we're part of. And we problem solve locally. I wanna pause on that last principle, the fifth, which is we're making the big decisions centrally. We're communicating centrally to be as consistent as we possibly can, but we problem solve locally. The basis of our decision-making is terrific thinking and problem solving that we draw on from across the university. So I ran through those very quickly for you. Let me fill in that picture briefly and then we'll turn to conversation. And I'm gonna ask our guests to fill in the picture even more. Phase decision-making is critical at a moment where you can only plan for the short term. That's still where we are. Things remain in flux, changing hourly. The decision about commencement is a really good example for that. We, of that, we, we delayed finding a time for an in-person commencement until we had better information. And this community was incredibly supportive of that delay that was hard to remain in uncertainty for so long. The second principle is to draw on multiple perspectives. There's a small group of five human beings that are making final decisions about the big questions that we face. Several of them are here today. That group is the provost, our senior vice president for finance and administration, our CFO, our VP for student affairs, and myself. However, we draw on the knowledge of a broad and multidisciplinary group from around the university. So when we made the decision to move the entire university to learning at a distance, for example, we presented it to about 30 leaders from across the university in a room together. That's our cabinet plus several domain experts. We needed their feedback and their diverse perspectives before making that decision. And that's the, the third key principle of decision making, which is continually to listen, actively, curiously, relentlessly to listen to the community to make sure we have robust feedback loops that can help us respond to the impact of decisions and refine our decisions as we go forward. We're doing that with as much transparency and fullness as we can. Your feedback helps with that. Many of you will remember from our thinking forward conversations in my first year that when I opened those dialogues, I said that my leadership begins with listening. And this is an extension of that, this principle. Feedback has informed our communications at every step. Those FAQs that you read are changing daily. We update them to respond to the questions that come our way and new conditions on the ground. And we're crafting our messages with care so that you know that we understand that many of the choices we are making are wrenching. We're counting on you to help us find the gaps, what we've missed, what else do we need to address. And we're approaching, again, these kinds of decisions, all of them with humility. No human being can do this work well solo. We don't have a roadmap and we do count on each other. So steady consultation with our peers has been important with state agencies. I'm especially grateful to the other presidents in the Virginia State Higher Ed System, to the governor and his cabinet, and to Williamsburg leadership, who've been amazing partners in this last intense six weeks. Fourth principle, as I said, was to consider impacts as broadly as possible, to embrace William and Mary as a whole and as a whole ecosystem, and to think of its role in the wider community as part of our responsibility. So six weeks in, that group of 30 has expanded to 70 plus leaders and communicators from different schools and divisions on campus, working with total focus and shared purpose. We meet, well, we met up until last week, twice weekly for 90 minutes. It's now once weekly because the pace has slowed just a little bit in order to work through emerging issues and questions that come up and to think ahead we won't always land where a given individual would, 
but that's because we're listening to a very broad set of constituencies and resources. We're looking at a lot of different guidance and data. Students, faculty, staff, parents, peers, alumni, neighbors, state agencies and guidelines, our board, where appropriate, uh, the William and Mar Williamsburg leadership, these are all sources of critical consultation. If you'd asked me two months ago, would I have believed that a team of five would be the core in making final decisions about big questions facing the university? I'd say yes, that totally makes sense. I would not have believed that a team of 70 would grow into an effective leadership team that's guiding William & Mary's response an effective consultation team and problem solving team. But that's what's happened wonderfully. And it's allowed us to bring crucial skills and capabilities that we needed to make decisions well. I last week discovered a recent McKinsey article from late in March describing how higher ed could respond to COVID-19 by creating integrated nerve centers. We grew this group of 70 organically because of that final principle of decision making that we've held to, to make big decisions centrally, to communicate centrally, but to problem solve locally. And it's wonderful and very affirming to see that that kind of distributed but centralized communication and problem solving is viewed as one of the most effective out there for higher ed. Higher education, William & Mary as an example, we are highly distributed organizations. That is a huge strength right now. In normal times, that makes it hard for us to change or move forward. Right now, it makes us incredibly resilient. What I mean by that is that if a faculty member or a staff member gets ill in the English department, there is somebody who can step in for that class. And if that happens there, it's not going to affect the library or facilities or classes in the business school our highly distributed system is also highly resilient in crisis. We trust the deep expertise of our staff and our faculty and the understanding of students about how they know how to learn well. And we ask them for a lot. We trust them a lot and we seek feedback often. So that's what we're doing right now. Uh, we're now standing up a plan ahead team to take this same framework for decision making and problem solving to begin to think about what lies ahead in the fall and beyond. We'll have a series of squads looking at five different domains of work and planning over the next five weeks. And I'll be messaging and communicating about that in the next several days. So let me shift to conversation right now. I'm gonna ask this group to focus as we do on some of the big questions we've been hearing about from the community about the impact of COVID-19 at William & Mary and I'm grateful to have several William & Mary leaders with me today. Our Provost and Chief Academic Officer, Peggy Agoras. Our VP for Finance and Technology, Amy Sebring. Our VP for Strategy, Strategic Initiatives and Public Affairs, Henry Bravis. Our VP for Student Affairs, Ginger Ambler. Also, Ellie Thomas, student member of William & Mary Strategic Planning Steering Committee. Uh, and on Monday, Ellie finished her term as Student Assembly Vice President. Welcome, Ellie. And Avi Chadra, Chadra, who is about 36 hours into retirement as the Student Assembly Chief of Staff and also one day after his 22nd birthday. Congratulations, Avi. Thank you. First off, I want to congratulate the two of you. Uh, it was an amazing year an extraordinary year for Student Assembly, one that I think has defined how Student Assembly can work for uh, the decades to come. How did you feel yesterday inaugurating our 300, 238th Student Assembly? We had a wonderful swearing in moment. And I know you were thinking about this year and its impact. I think the word that describes how I was feeling and I think how our whole team was feeling is just grateful. Um, it's not just about the three of us who have gotten to take part in a lot of meetings, but really about our entire team and the energy and passion that everyone has brought. Um, I, we're so excited to see what the next team does, but we couldn't have done it without them. And we really do depend and rely on each other. I think, you guys. Oh, go ahead, Avi. 
Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think um, grateful is a really good way to describe it, but also optimistic in a lot of ways, uh, just because those throughout student assembly and the throughout student assembly and also the people who have come to student assembly seeking help in this time, we've crafted solutions together and they all really understand how we came to the decisions we came to. Um, and so it's encouraging to know that these people have the knowledge and the foresight to be able to work through what is what promises to be a challenging next few months and carry us into a fall semester where they're going to seek to create as much community as possible. I met the two of you with Kelsey almost a year ago and one of the things that struck me really powerfully then was how focused your leadership style was. You came in with a platform for strategic planning already, a really, really terrific one, wanting to be a partner with the administration and also with a clear sense that you were working as a team. Um, certainly hearing that in your description of this transition with Student Assembly, I have valued Student Assembly's partnership so much in the last two months. So I want to ask you a little bit about your leadership roles during the crisis. What changed in how you thought about your leadership? And did anything surprise you? I think the biggest thing was an expansion of duty and just the pace at which these decisions were happening. Um, if you had asked me at the start of the semester what the end of our term was going to look like, I would have never predicted this. Um, but I think instead of focusing on the change, I actually like to focus on the constants, um, the relationships that we've formed over the past year, the processes that we've put in place, um, the way that we re rely on our team and have built trust. I think um, that's what's really helped us get through this time and these quick decisions and assuming good intent in one another. And I guess what surprised me the most is um, it's encouraging. I think students really trust us and I, I hope that they feel that they can rely on us in that way and that um, we serve them well. But just receiving the personal emails that I did, um, Kelsey would say, if you have questions, please reach out to us. And people did. I was receiving um, sometimes 20 emails a day or on the phone with students, trying to comfort them and just be an ear for them. And that was um, a really rewarding thing to be able to do for my community. You, you all, the three of you amplified our ability to listen in such a powerful way. I think, um... On the same note, I think what continued for us was kind of that focused sense of leadership. Um, and I think a really good example of that is, you know, in late March when we were starting to see the, poss the very real possibility, or mid-March when we were starting to see the possibility of, you know, stay-at-home orders and things like that, the university had to close down completely and we had to close all the dorms. I think our first, we kind of triaged our goals and, you know, the communication we were getting from students, we triaged it and said, our first priority is making sure that students have a state, safe and stable living condition after this. And that meant we were working, we were on the phone with Dr. Ambler a lot and trying to figure this out. Um, so I think that kind of goal orientation and being super focused in what we were doing has stayed. I think what's increased a lot is we always prioritize communication as a two way street in listening, but also communicating out. Um, when we first heard about, you know, the announcement that was going to come out that, that the university was going to close for a period of time, our first priority was getting information out to students that we thought would be most relevant for them to support the messaging that the university was giving. Um, so communication has always been central for us. And in that same vein, um, something I learned from uh, Lauren Garrett, this is a Lauren Garrett face, she says, um, assume good intent. And I think that's helped a lot in working with students, working with faculty, staff, university administration, and it's, I, it's guided a lot of our term, but especially now. I think the way you guys have worked has built enormous trust. And one thing I observed to Kelsey that has changed is a year ago, I think you entered roles where students at William & Mary were your primary audience and constituency. In fact, now the whole university listens to you. And so do our alumni, so do our neighbors the scope and range and impact of that leadership role has really expanded in ways that I think build trust quite powerfully and I hope will build lasting trust. Let me bring a few of our other guests into the conversation. I wanna ask each of you to give an example about how one of our big decisions was made, starting with Peggy. The big decision that we had to grapple with first was grading policy changes. 
adaptations for spring 2020 to our grading policies that were gonna be necessitated by the adaptation to learning at a distance. Can you say a few words about how we went through that process? Sure, my pleasure. Um, at a high level, uh, we always stay with our own process. We try to be consistent with our culture and values and our own pace. So we try to make all decisions in a consultative, complementary, inclusive, and above all responsive manner, as you previously said. So regarding the adjustment to go to pass fail, which is a big adjustment for the students of William and Mary, um, we worked on um, several phases. Seemingly, it appears to be a simple decision. Uh, well, um, let me walk you through the process and you'll understand why it is not. Uh, following our immediate announcement um, uh, of extending our undergraduate pass-fail um, policy uh, by one extra class, uh, which we made by consulting with the Dean of Undergraduate Studies and the University Registrar, we started discussing how more of an expansion we need to do. And so um, we announced March 20, an expansion of pass-fail to all undergraduate classes without limitation, uh, which was made uh, through um, collaboration with uh, um, the um, registrar, uh, working with other institutions across the states, um, talking with undergraduate associate deans, who in turn talked with their faculty committees and chairs, uh, the vice provost and myself discussed this with the faculty assembly leadership. Uh, we discussed it with the dean of students. We analyzed student input, which ranged from emails that followed the first announcement, went through a petition, and several uh, of them mentioned uh, the um, interest of having choice. We also checked with the State Council on Higher Education for Virginia and the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Uh, for guidance in terms of uh, potential accreditation issues. So the announcement came March 20, but the process uh, included a lot of uh, steps. Now, after the announcement of March 20, we still continue to, um, to work on uh, how we do this for graduate programs. So graduate programs now are making their own individualized plan which in turn required extensive coordination work and communication within the schools. Um, we responded to uh, numerous um, queries from students uh, that the majority of them were actually uh, questioning whether the May 29 date was indeed real. Yes, it is real. Uh, this is the day that uh, until then for people to choose, uh, we wrote a FAQ response. We updated the registrar's website so that everybody can link to it. Uh, we work with the Studio for Teaching and Learning Innovation to respond with additional content. And last but not least, the registrar's office is working on banner actions, which are necessary to make this. Now, I have to mention here that um, because this is an unusual and a big adjustment, as I said, for William and Mary, uh, the transcripts will contain language that explains this option and that it will be, it will be labeled to relate to COVID-19. So overall, I'm gonna stop here by saying, this has been a typical process regarding every decision that we have made that ranges from students to faculty leaders uh, to, um, to our uh, hierarchy of structure uh, all the way up to the president's office. And uh, I couldn't be happier to have this partners, all these partners in this decision-making process. Thank you. I mean, you've given a great picture of the complexity of one seemingly really simple decision and how many interests and guidelines and regulations circle around it. I, I really appreciate that every student will have COVID marked for this semester on their transcript. I want to just say that the reasoning behind the, the opening up pass fail is to take the pressure off. And I would ask every student to think about this as the default, not the exception. That's my best advice. Give yourself grace, take the pressure off. Know that you can always have a grade if you want it, but make that decision now that you will take the pressure off yourself. Don't think of this as um, a fail safe later. 
Because if you take the pressure off now, ultimately you will do much better anyways. Uh, so that's, that's, my, that's my guidance. Give yourself grace. Let me shift to Henry and ask you, Henry, can you quickly talk about how you, in, at the moment when we were just about to move into letting new students know what William & Mary is like, how you very, very quickly worked through standing up an incredible ad admissions process as you did that ended with something as marvelous as Saturday. I'm still getting notes from family and students saying how much they appreciated the digital admission days. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. And um, let me say too, one of the things I miss most uh, is lunch with colleagues across campus. So I am conjuring in my mind lots of people around a screen eating lunch at this time, and that this is a, a sort of a makeup session for that. So one consolation. Um, and uh, you know, we were fortunate. We have such great leadership in the admission office already. And I think going back to what you talked about in terms of process, the consultation, the effort to pull others into that, um, that transition that we made, not unlike the transition our faculty made to think about how to deliver course content online. We had to think about how to approach the month of April uh, virtually. And I think a really important pivot uh, early on was, was made by recognizing that our goal was never to recreate programs. It was to generate connections. And so how do we do that in new ways that are not constrained by our thinking of, of, of what those old models uh, were? Uh, I'm reminded, and I mentioned this in our, our pre-discussion, that early television looked a lot like theater with a single camera on it. And so we really wanted to take full advantage of the range of platforms, not just throw everything up on Zoom, uh, although we've had a lot of that, in fact, uh, Professor Rio Frio in Hispanic Studies has an online lecture today at four o'clock for those who are interested. But how do we do that? that? Yeah, yeah. So, so catch that because um, uh, we all love Rio. Um, but also, how do we do things like use Instagram as the right platform for student organizations to really put themselves on display? Uh, every single department and program uh, participated on Saturday in these chats and not just chats that were one to many, but breakout rooms, uh, individual opportunities for admitted students to connect with, with uh, other current students. I know Abby has been involved in that as one of our, our tour guides. Um, so just such an incredible range of options, range of media were, were put out there. And I, and I really believe that the personal attention for which William & Mary is rightly known uh, was was signaled through 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 that effort, and as I said, a, a credit to uh, just so many across campus who came together in that effort. Dean Kennedy said something last week in our conversation that really underscores that mindset shift. That the goal was to make personal connections above all. Um, she said one of the things that she is finding is more authenticity actually not less, because in these incredibly difficult circumstances, what you bring is who you are. And that's all you can bring. And that that's in some ways quite powerful to know that people are shown who they are. Let's, let's, let me ask Amy to speak to key decisions about rebates. I know rebates have been an incredibly important topic of conversation and in part because of that precisely that sense of financial uncertainty and vulnerability that so many families feel. So could you describe that decision making process briefly? Sure. Um, and, and I think it's important to think through, you know, the decisions we're making are actually, uh, they're not, we're not being driven by finance decisions. We're mm -hmm. making decisions for the health and safety of our students um, to make sure we're, we're taking care of our employees meeting our obligations for uh, teaching and learning, and they're resulting in financial decisions. So the decision to um, close our housing and dining programs for this semester were clearly not a financial decision. That was a public health decision. Um, rebates were the financial decision. That was the outcome of making the public health decision that we needed to make to ensure the safety of our students. Um, and it, as with all of our financial decisions, I think it's really important to um, understand kind of the core, the context of William & Mary's financial constructs. So 
Um, we are very much a, a student revenue driven institution. Seven, 75% of our revenue comes from student tuition and fees. Uh, they are our customer. Um, our biggest expenditure is salaries. We're a people driven organization. So um, those are, are always sort of on the inputs and outputs, the, the major um, items that we're looking at. And we're not a corporate entity. Um, we don't operate to drive a bottom line. Um, and when we take a financial hit, we're cutting programs and services, which unfortunately ultimately means people. Um, we're not reducing stockholder earnings. Um, so all of that as we're working through and trying to balance the financial decisions, um, you know, that's an important uh, part of context. Abby and I had that conversation a couple of weeks ago as we were trying to uh, sort through some of the questions uh, that uh, students were having around the rebate decisions. So how do we get to the decision on rebates? We really were trying to balance two objectives. Um, we were trying to recognize that students weren't going to get the benefit of the housing and dining programs uh, for the remainder of the camp uh, or remainder of the semester. And we were also um, trying to make sure we covered the university's obligations. And that included debt service, uh, debt payments on our dorms, contractual obligations to our dining partner and, and salaries for essential personnel. Um, so the resulting rebates were really a balance in trying to recognize both of those obligations and to try to care for our people, both the students and the employees that make those programs run. Thanks. What was the recognition you had, Abby, with, with Amy talking to each other about this? What was that moment? Can you say more about that? Yeah. Um, so I studied government and finance at school, and typically we talk about, you know, corporate entities and stock buybacks and things like that. And I think we were kind of in the discussion about, you know, how, how are the amounts being determined for the rebates and kind of getting a little more technical with that. And I think the moment where it came is where Amy was talking about it and said, you know, we have these obligations and we don't drive, we're not trying to drive a profit here. We're not a corporation. Um, and I think that's a really simple statement that <laughs> helps simplify the equation, I think, for me and helped me explain it out because, again, a, our big priority is communication. It helps us talk to people and say, you know, there's there's no dividend coming out at the end of the quarter here. Like, that's not the point, so. Uh, to me, a really good example of, and Kelsey and I have talked a lot about this too. Um, we talked about it yesterday with the two of you, how important it is to hear how somebody with a, in a different position in our ecosystem is processing uh, a particular issue or decision. And when we can get that input how much better we are at explaining and being transparent in the ways that we want to. So I've been really grateful for that constant consultation with student assembly, um, with parents uh, that for feedback that we get, with faculty. Um, it's making it easier to be transparent because we know what we need to speak to. Uh, so Ginger, let me invite you in huge decision that we have come to in part with a really resourceful problem solving of the commencement committee. And I'd love to hear you talk about how we came to the decision on commencement. So you mentioned the phase one, which was to recognize that we were not going to be able to have commencement the way we know it in May. Um, but then we were able to lean into our existing leadership structure. So shared governance is an important part of how higher ed works. And we have an amazing commencement policy committee that actually had been working all year to make recommendations for this May's commencement. And so that representative body, which includes faculty, staff, graduate and undergraduate students, all schools are represented, um, came together to work in a new mode with a new charge. And our charge was, what do we do in the circumstance that we find ourselves in? Um, and so we started, as you were describing at the university level, we started with developing guiding principles for what we would do. And um, those were, we wanted commencement to feel personal. We wanted it to affirm community. We wanted it to be inclusive of graduate and undergraduate students, to be accessible, even at a remote location by families and friends, to be distinctive, because William & Mary is a distinctive institution. And then the, the phrase that we've used the most is the principle that we wanted May in particular to be different and joyful. So both and. Um, recognizing that um, replicating what we're going to do in person in the fall was not what our community actually wanted. Um, the student voice was primary for us as we were having our discussions and it was the students who said, 
Uh, we want to preserve those main traditions for when we can be back together again. That's really important to us. So things like ringing the red bell, walking across campus, the candlelight ceremony, they did not want a virtual replication of that in May. And so the personal bell ringing is my best example of that. The decision that on the last day of class is when the tradition on campus is to ring the red bell, is to still celebrate in a joyful fashion that, that major milestone of the last day of classes and have students wherever they are with whatever bell they can find or choose to, uh, to ring the bell and to send that video in so that we can share in the joy together. So that's my best example. But again, it came out of expertise that we already had on campus, a real listening posture to hearing what our class of 2020 wanted and making sure that we had guiding principles to keep us on track in our decision making. And I'll say that that's a beautiful example of this distributed problem solving local problem solving with a central decision because you brought me that proposal from the commencement committee and that was joyful just hearing we're going to imagine this newly we're going to create some traditions that may end up being durable that william and mary adopts out of this extraordinary year and the the both and degree conferral and commencement that we plan um, just ask for Abby and Ellie, what are you hearing back from your fellow seniors about that? Any thoughts that we should be keeping in mind? I think that from what I've heard, um, students are excited. I think we all know that this is a strange time that we're in, um, but this is certainly a graduation that no one will forget. Um, and in a lot of ways, there are opportunities here, I think, to remember um, the graduation of our class. Um, I don't speak for everybody, but I think I think that this will bring people together for a long time, and I've already seen those connections start to happen. I think a lot of the same. Um, <clears throat> I think people are more than anything just excited to see everyone again um, and see all their friends one last time. I think, and I we may you know be a good ways into new careers or schools or something, and it'll be nice to be back together. Um, so people are really looking forward to that from what I've heard. I think we're also looking forward to it not being 100 degrees. Um, so these are all benefits, <laughs> I think. And also that homecoming's the week, weekend after. So hopefully we can get some time off and swing right through homecoming too. Um, so we are close to the end of our time. I'm going to do a, a, something we haven't done before, which is a lightning round, where I'm going to ask a one sentence question. You get a one sentence answer for everybody here. Um, Starting with Peggy, how is William & Mary planning for the fall semester? Are we gonna be able to hold in-person classes? Yes, absolutely. We have every intention of holding in-person classes in the fall, of course, as long as it is safe to do so. We are rigorously planning right now for the next year and we'll have more information and details by June. Thank you. Amy, what impact has COVID-19 had on the university's finances and budget broadly? So in the short term, we're anticipating between now and fall, um, a thir 13 to $32 million uh, hit in terms of foregone revenue or unintended expenses. Um, what that's meant is uh, we are really, really focused. I think you referenced early on in making sure that we're flattening the financial curve that we are um, minimizing our expenditures and really focused on those things that are mission crit critical. Because as I alluded to, we understand that any dollar we can save today gives us a buffer as we look to the future and, and try to understand what the economic impact may be long-term. We're doing all of it with an eye to making sure that we can preserve our people and our programs. And, and that's at the core of the decisions we're making right now. Thank you. Henry, how are we supporting students and staff who are facing hardships right now? Broadly, the watchwords have been empathy, flexibility, and patience, uh, which are, to your point about how we're more ourselves in these circumstances, those are reflective of the values of this community anyway. And they've been wonderfully, um, and I think sometimes even unexpectedly reciprocal, whether that's the student who is encouraging the faculty member who's in unfamiliar territory delivering a course or the staff member who has a young family recognizing that actually households of one are encountering different and no 
no less difficult challenges at home uh, as well. So enormous coming together uh, as we figure out how to navigate the unfamiliar. Ginger, what's your favorite creative adaptation that you've seen? Um, oh gosh, every couple of days I see a new one, but I will say the one that has captured my imagination most recently is the, um, the virtual acapella recording that Double Take has, um, has circulating on social media. You can see it on their website or, uh, I'm sorry, on their Facebook page um, or on YouTube. But uh, their cover of Rivers and Roads is A, beautiful, B, so appropriate in terms of message for this time and so symbolic of what it means for a student community to come together in whatever circumstances they find themselves um, to be one tribe. In that spirit, Ellie, what's your favorite student connection since we've moved to distance learning? I think I talked about it a bit before, but um, I've had a couple of students reach out to me and we've had extended conversations. Um, just people who I hadn't even met before on campus who we were texting and calling. Um, and it, these are just people who, are, it started as needing help um, and then turned to friendships. And I really loved that. Hmm. Abby, what are you looking forward to at commencement? Uh, two things. I think seeing all my friends, those who are going to graduate and those who are on campus and being able to give them hugs, being able to handshake, that's going to be huge. Um, and the second is cheese fries at Paul's. Uh, you're being your authentic self. I Thanks for that. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> So I want to thank all our guests for so much thoughtful conversation for the inside picture of how we've worked through some of the most challenging decisions we've got. I want to thank everybody else for continuing to tune in and for sending your feedback. We read every comment and that is helping us improve how we communicate. Uh, it's giving us a richer experience of your perspectives, your interests as we make decisions going forward. We know there are questions that we weren't able to get to such as proctoring for exams, a number of questions that we'll be dealing with in plan planned town halls going forward for students and families in the coming weeks. So stay tuned for those. And we will continue to add to our FAQs daily at our COVID page. So finally, today is Earth Day, everybody. William & Mary is gonna be hosting a number of activities virtually this week, culminating on Saturday when our Provost Agoras is going to read the Lorax. So for more details on that, you can follow William & Mary Sustainability online. I'm going to close the way that I always do, which is to say, stay well, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>